In 2006, the Panama Canal Authority completed the master plan for the proposed Panama Canal expansion project. Chapter 6 of the plan refers to the navigation channels for the expanded canal, Atlantic and Pacific entrance, Gatun Lake, and Culebra Cut. The steep and narrow winding channel of the Culebra Cut stretches for seven miles through the Continental Divide. The channel's bottom is composed primarily of hard rock, making it the most treacherous section of the navigation in the Panama Canal. This is what a Panamax vessel of 32 meters in beam looks like in the Culebra Cut. According to the ACP's master plan, the straight sections of the Culebra Cut were widened to a minimum of 218 meters. This will permit one-way daylight transit through the Culebra Cut for vessels of 46 meters in beam. These are the dimensions of the design ship that was used to determine the post-Panamax navigation channel configuration. The master plan also established that vessels over 46 meters in beam would be handled in a case-by-case -case basis. If transit demand for these vessels increases, the ACP would implement the necessary adjustments to the navigation channels of the Culebra Cut to allow the safe and efficient transit of such vessels. The master plan indicates that the design ship used to determine the dimensions of the new locks will be larger with 49 meters in beam. On May 9, 2014, the Panama Canal pilots received an official notice from the ACP's Executive Vice President of Operations, Mr. Esteban Saenz. The purpose of the document was to inform the pilots that on February 1, 2015, the ACP would operate with a new set of regulations for channel navigation in the Panama Canal. Honestly, I was shocked when I received this letter. Pilots need to be included in this type of decisions regarding proposed changes in the navigation rules, and we were not. After looking at the new restriction tables, I can tell you right now that the ACP is deviating greatly from their own master plan. For example, the Culebra Cut was widened to 218 meters for the purpose of having one-way daylight transits for post-Panamax vessels of 46 meters in beam. Looking at the new restriction table, two post-Panamax vessels of 49 meters in beam can magically meet in the Culebra Cut without widening the cut any further, and there are not even the proper engineering studies to support this proposed change. I requested these hydrodynamic studies to uh, Mr. Uh, Stephen Sands, the Vice President of Operations, and his answer, to my surprise, was that they do not exist. This is totally irresponsible, and we don't think this is even possible. And as far as we know, this type of proposed maneuvers is not done anywhere in the world in a narrow channel with characteristics that are similar to the Culebra Cut. In March 2006, the ACP's Department of Engineering and Projects released the report Technical Analysis on the Proposed Panama Canal Post-Panamax Navigation Channel as one of the studies used to elaborate the master plan. Appendix number two of this study contains the table Navigation Channel Characteristics. The table indicates that in order for two post-Panamax vessels of 46 meters in beam to be able to meet in the Culebra Cut the straight reaches would have to be widened to a minimum of 280 meters, a 28.4% increase in width on the straight sections of the cut. Channel design is a complex process. It's comprised of many factors and variables, as well as risk assessment and technological input, such as simulation. It is not just a linear calculation. We need to study the hydrodynamic forces occurring in shallow and confined waters in order to develop the restrictions of vessels navigating in the Culebra Cut. Scientific methodology, experimental fluid dynamics, computational fluid dynamics, simulation. Apply guidelines and recommendations in the design of approach channels and waterways from international organizations such as PIANC. PIANC was widely referred to in the ACP technical report and master plan. The input of active, experienced pilots is imperative throughout this entire process so that we can develop safe parameters for efficient vessel navigation in the Culebra Cut. This practice is the international standard. The pilots were not involved in this process in spite of many requests from our group to be included. But the ACP continuously refers to pilots' input in many other studies. 
And I would like to clarify that these are pilots in management positions, some of them going on a decade without completing a full transit in the Panama Canal. In contrast, active pilots transit the Panama Canal about 160 times a year. Let's not forget that the proficiency of a pilot greatly depends on its continuous exposure to its local waterway. The role of the Panama Canal pilots will be very important for the success of the expanded canal. We are experts in piloting Panamax vessels through the existing locks. The new canal poses many challenges, including having to maneuver vessels three times the size of a Panamax vessel through locks without the assistance of locomotives. For the last three years, we have made many requests to the ACP to be included in the design of a training program for post-Panamax vessels in the expanded canal. In February 2014, we submitted our own proposal for post-Panamax training to the ACP. And the immediate response from the ACP from Mr. Seven Signs was that they were not interested. After a 15-month campaign creating awareness for the need of training for the new locks, we finally received a proposal from the ACP that contained similar elements to the ones that we had in our proposal. The decision of the ACP to ignore 100 years of experience of moving vessels successfully through the existing locks with the use of locomotives and adopting a new system based on the use of tugs, which is not as safe and efficient as the present one, makes it crucial for the pilots to have additional training that may mitigate the shortcomings of this new positioning system. On May 22nd, as part of the Panama Canal pilots' own independent efforts to prepare for the expanded canal, we travel to San Francisco to meet with the San Francisco bar pilots and inquire about the process they underwent in preparing for the arrival of their first post-Panamax vessel to the port of Oakland. In 2010, we were notified that we were going to start receiving ultra-large container ships. So we had one year to prepare for the arrival of these ultra-larges, and it was a quantum leap in size and displacement. So our first consideration was, can we bring these ships in day in and day out and, and turn them and safely move them? So with that, we had to consider collecting data uh, that would involve simulation and engineering uh, studies. We have two problems with these ultra-large container ships. One is weight displacement. We have a problem much heavier, 30, 40,000 tons heavier than our Panamax class ships, and nearly double the wind area. Let's assume we, uh, so the ship we're on today had a 46 meter uh, beam, beam yeah. and it was, it was 363 meters or 1192. So let's say five degrees of leeway on that ship is might not be 50% increase in the path that the ship sweeps down a channel. And this data can be determined. Yes. I just don't have it offhand. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's assume uh, 30 to 40%. So 10 degrees of leeway might not be 100%, but it's certainly going to be 80. So you're going to take your 45 meter beam and add 40 meters. Right. Uh, you're going to be looking at a sweat path of, of uh, 85 meters. So we have a chart of San Francisco Central Bay. Here we can see the Golden Gate Bridge. The ultra-large container ships come in. We transit uh, toward the Oakland Bay Bridge. From this point, we have tugs made up and we proceed across what we call the Oakland Bar Channel. And this channel, the current is either flooding on your beam or ebbing on your beam. So we can get up to three knots of current in this area. With the ultra-larges, we don't go above one knot of ebb or one and a half knots of flood. The tugs are made up and we proceed in to the Oakland Inner Harbor Estuary. And at this point where we are at, it's 900 feet wide here, and it narrows down to 700 feet in this area. We proceed in to our turning basin, which isn't what we would call an official turning basin. It's certainly big enough to turn the ships safely, but not a lot of room. We have about 30 meters on each end when we're turning. The 
ship is then brought back and taken to one of the berths along here in Oakland. So I think for the lessons learned for us was number one, we had to agree as a group, okay, having been presented with all the data, the simulation study, the engineering interaction studies, uh, the discussion amongst the group ourselves, okay, let's go ahead and, and start uh, bringing them in. But we had to have very conservative guidelines and parameters. The point of that was to make sure everyone was comfortable. After a conservative operational channel restriction is established, it is only the Panama Canal pilots' professional expertise and skills that can maximize and push the limits of what is perceived to be possible, therefore giving value to the expansion in a safe and efficient manner. Global and international media, the ACP's executive vice president of operations, Mr. Stephen Sainz, was quoting as saying that canal pilots have participated in theoretical and practical training programs in Bedendrick clubs. Have you ever been trained at Bedendrick? No, I haven't, and none of my colleagues have been either.